is that I try and work where I can provide a contribution that will change the industry. Change is going to happen, and it always happens for the better, and it's always painful. You got to remain teachable at every level and any age. Welcome to Vet Life Reimagined, the podcast that challenges the status quo and explores the boundless possibilities of veterinary medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Sprinkle. Today, we have a visionary guest who embodies the essence of forward thinking. Meet Steve May, a true trailblazer who began his journey in veterinary hospitals and quickly transformed into a remarkable entrepreneur. Throughout his career, Steve has worn numerous hats within the veterinary industry, including spearheading marketing strategies for VCA hospitals and collaborating with industry game changers. His wealth of experiences has gifted him with a treasure trove of captivating stories that he shares with us today. Not only does Steve possess an intimate knowledge of the individuals who are shaping the veterinary profession, but he is one of them. Towards the end of our conversation, I asked Steve, what are the characteristics that define trendsetters in veterinary medicine? And he delivers an exceptional answer that you will not want to miss. So let's get to this conversation where Steve dives right into his extraordinary career in veterinary medicine. And I, I saw the need for a pet transportation company. So I opened that up. And, you know, naming and marketing is everything. So I was the first pet limo, and it was decked out in 1980, oh gosh, 84. And so we did, uh, the whole idea was to do uh, emergency and routine to veterinaries, boarding, grooming, et cetera. And what happened is that I, I ended up you know, making the flyers. We we didn't have internet at the time. <laughs> and I, you know, made some appointments with local veterinarians that I know. And they said, you know, they took a tour uh, of the, uh, of what I was driving. And they said, wow, this is really nice. Absolutely. And then, you know, the whole maintenance was the same as uh, inside of a hospital. We used Rocal at the time and everything was clean. And, you know, we swapped out the towels and no animal was ever mixed with another animal. So it was all individualized in terms of transportation. And my flyers were just gone in like five days. I returned back to the hospital and it's like, okay, they're throwing it out. I mean, it's like they're throwing it out. And then a light switch hit and oh my God, I started getting calls left and right and I didn't know how to manage them. And so I had to buy this device that at the time would connect to your phone and then once the device re- knows it's a phone call coming in, it beeps me because we had beepers at that time. So, it, and it kept going off and I would run to pay phones and I just did it because we didn't have cellular phones. And uh, it ended up uh, a long 10 years. I franchised it. And uh, so I kept the West LA and that covered a lot of Southern California, maybe like five, 10 air miles, which is a lot in terms of just like regular miles. And then I opened up in uh, Coachella Valley and uh, at Desert View Animal Hospital, and they had their own truck. And I sold a few other franchises and uh, got sold out, got bought out, I should say. And after three meetings with uh, VCA, uh, I was like, "Eh, the earthquake just hit and my call volume in LA tripled but I still what normally would take me 11 to 15 minutes to get across town, took me 45 minutes. And I'm like, well, maybe I should just sell my list and sell my, you know. So I made a decision. I hopped over to the corporate world. We had a JV with uh, VCA and Heinz and launched a hyperallergenic dog treat and therapeutic dog foods and premium dog foods. And we were the only company to actually make a profit in under 10 years. We did it in three which is wow. a remarkable, yeah. From 10 so, to 3? 10 to 3. And wow. so we ended up selling to Heinz. They took it over. They merged it with Nature's Recipe, and a few of them went to Del Monte, and then Royal Canine picked it up. So some of my some of my ingredients and brands are still out there today, which is really great. And I moved over to the corporate marketing side. I was VP of corporate marketing for VCA for a while. And so I handled, obviously, the business itself as well as the hospital marketing. And then I jumped over to – I did that for quite a while, actually. And then I jumped over to veterinary pet insurance, and I was VP and executive for uh, the veterinary division 
which was really busy. And so that's my bird, if you hear him, tequila. And uh, he likes to chime in once in a while. So Procter & Gamble had brought in Imes. And so they kind of cleared out the marketing department. And I said, you know what? It's time to go on my own. So I started an agency. Uh, I primarily focused in on veterinary medicine and that industry, pet industry. And I brought in a couple of partners and we were swamped. And of course, my key customer was VCA. And then it merged to Antec. And I was with Antec the last 10 years out of the 30, you know, just working on diagnostics. There was just a, myself. I ran the marketing department. And then there was obviously we had a senior VP of uh, uh, marketing and development, business development. So I've always kind of been on my own. And so now I'm, I have a number of clients all over the place, whether they're independents or corporate or industry. Uh, and I'll do everything from business development, strategic marketing and planning, social media content, communications, and it goes on and on and on and on. So uh, the nice part about it is that I'm able to keep up and understand the trends of the veterinary marketplace. You know, it's interesting. You know, when I when I started, if you look at the 70s and the 80s, let's see, an office call was $12. Of fecal analysis was eight dollars, and a vaccine was twenty-two to thirty-five dollars a piece. Obviously, we know that flipped, right? Yes. So, and we had one board-certified radiologist, Dr. Gomez, that would come and travel to one hospital where a cluster of us in the area of individual independent hospitals would come and bring their cases. So, case review was maybe two or three weeks before we can get back to a client which is a long time. So, uh, but we took advantage of it and then everything started to shift. You know, somewhere in the, around the 80s, you started to see board certified specialists come out of academia into private practice. Uh, technology was a little more advanced. We still didn't have the internet, but we had specialists. And so specialty emergency centers started to pop up. And that was really a great thing because the independent, you know, can't work 24 seven and neither can their associate. And so I started watching this and I'm like, okay, I'm right in the middle. I said, wow, there, there's gotta be an issue about, you know, if I had an emergency and I had to take my pet to the vet, what would be the best way of doing it? Now I would be a complete mess, panicked. And then there goes the pet transportation idea. And I took it to fruition and hit, I mean, I, I hit every mass media outlet globally. So it started out with People Magazine full page, and it went to multiple radio stations weekly, and it carried in news for a cycle of nine and a half weeks. I think I only had one yellow page listening, and it just had my company and my phone number. And everything else was just grace. So that's where I kind of learned my PR, and, uh, and I took it into every client uh, that I have today. Uh, and so I did all the morning show circuits and, you know, all the shows from The View and uh, the Today Show. And, you know, I would hop on a plane. I was in New York every six weeks to do a media tour and meet with all the magazines and networks. And so that's like incredible, incredible. And when I look at like today, if I look at the 70s, 80s, 90s and 2000, there was a paradigm shift in terms of growth, both consolidator, reference laboratory, imaging, all the rest of it came to the front door of the veterinarian. And whether they can afford it or not, there was terms, there's lease companies, everything kind of went up a level. There was a lot of fear with veterinarians. And they didn't have the training to read ultrasounds. And so the academy was put together and developed by one company in Texas where they can, they buy their equipment. They can just go in there for a week and learn about ultrasound imaging and techniques and reading. And, and it was, it's, it's to date, it's still great, by the way, I branded it. So it, it's really fun. Uh, and if you're seeing the shift to today, what I see is if you're looking at like in the eighties, you had reference laboratory equipment in-house. Then everyone went to reference outhouse. 
And I don't mean outhouse, I mean outside reference labs. And now we're seeing them begin to come back into veterinary practice. If you look at the top leaders of diagnostics, they all have certain equipment, in ter- in, including digital cytology, that can be read at the practice level and then sent off to their pathologists for a read. And so what normally would take, you know, two days, a day, it's, it's almost like two, three hours. So there's a paradigm shift, you know, technology and equipment kind of bring it up to the forefront. And I think veterinarians today are a lot more open to it. I know they're open to it. And I look at the different age groups, you know, I always monitor the stats and who are the progressive, you know, I look at age, I look at gender, and I look at style of practice, offerings of practice, and where I see change, where I don't see change and where we need change is that overall as an industry, you can pull up any news article now, just write veterinary shortage. And it's statewide, it's regional, it's local, it's national. And I know there are individuals making a difference, but collectively, when you look at maybe two universities at the most since 2015 or 17 were added to our number of veterinary university colleges, and you have a populace that's grown 100 million people, I mean, come on, it's, 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 we're not putting up enough grads, uh, and they're finally, some universities are now ex- expanding their classes, which is great. I read that a few are actually adding and building veterinary universities, and I think this could be seriously amplified, and there's a lot of resource by industry. I think industry is the one that hurts. Veterinarians are the one that hurts. Obviously, there's a shortage. And honestly, it's a fantastic, believe it or not, a fantastic time, even with all the closing of hospitals to open up an animal hospital. Yes, because if you know how to do it right, many Mm -hmm. hospitals will look at economy and say, it's the economy. It's my clients can't afford it. It's not. And once you get into that, roadmap of what's going on and economics is going to go, you know, that huge dip in the 70s. And we always thought our marketplace was recession proof. It really is. I mean, I've worked, I'm working now with two independents that are beginning to scream. They're so busy (laughs) and they're, they're book solid uh, six days a week. And now one's booking, uh, they're opening up on Sundays, so seven days a week. I mean, the demand is out there. The problems of salary, retention, training, all that is is never been completely and cohesively um, addressed. So, for instance, I go to the trade shows, usually the nationals, some of the regionals, you do too, and I'm sure some of your audience do too, and you come home fired, right? You're just you know, I, I maybe I've gone to some practice management. I learned some new te- technology. I learned great things on medicine I'm going to bring. And, and I am just pumped. And I got a chance to go on a Disneyland ride. Okay. So I'm, I'm feeling really good. I come back Monday morning and I get debriefed by my associate, my practice manager. It's not good. I got clients complaining. I've got billing. I've got a client starting at eight and I'm booked for an hour. And all of a sudden what happens? It implodes. And so they never really can actually apply what they want to do. And part of that marketing and what they want to do will grow the business. And so, you know, I've called even for my daughter's cat. She's, she's back in Los Angeles. So, and she says, dad, you know, I said, I got I to gotta get her in to see the vet. I said, okay, start calling some of the vets. Well, some don't have a vet. They said they're working only a couple of days a week. They're shorthand. I said, look. I'm going to give you a couple of names. They're busy. I'm going to get you in. It's just a matter of, it's not persistence. When there's a disconnect of umbilical cord from location to client, and that comes anywhere from customer service all the way down to veterinary service, you lost them and they will go elsewhere. So the attrition is not always economical. People usually carry, you know, somewhere between 200, $250 and $500 in their pet savings account if they have one, or that's usually what they have. It used to be $1,000, $2,000. Uh, 
And and now there's third party payment, there's pet insurance options, and we're the one country that doesn't really accelerate in pet insurance. And to me, it's incomprehensible. Uh, and I know why, because I was in the pet insurance business. So taking the pet insurance business, you buy a policy when they're young, you have a pet that's at the age of one or two, and he says, you know what, I'm going to buy this, and I'm going to get the routine care coverage with the vaccines that comes in all the flea and tick and all the rest of that stuff that comes with it. And all of a sudden, they're healthy for like three, four years. And, and it's like, I paid 350 bucks a year for this. And it's like, well, I'm not going to worry about it. Next thing you know, they're at the age of six. And you know, and your audience knows what happens when they get older. Everything kicks in. Kidney, arthritic, dental. It's just, you know, they just don't. And that's because the successful pet uh, insurance companies keep that umbilical cord connected. The successful at hospitals keep the umbilical cord connected. Even the referring hospitals that don't do the GP work, they stay connected. They stay connected with the referring veterinarians and their hospitals, and they provide locally CE for their group to come in to their practice. I mean, there's a million different techniques you can do. I talked to a doctor yesterday who's starting a, a practice, very successful, had uh, retired for five years, had a number of hospitals, but he's got the itch. So he's got to do it again. So he leased out a 56,000 square foot building. And automatically that tells me, okay, how many doctors and how many specialties are you going to provide? You're going 24 seven. Boom. And he says, yeah, we're going to start with urgent from seven to 11. And then we'll probably get an overnight. And, you know, it's really a big location and I'm having problems finding. I said, no, you should not have problems finding at all. You might have additional things you might need to do, like accommodations for veterinarians that come in and maybe fly in for three days and fly out, that's what you're going to have to do because the paradigm shifted. Till we solve this issue from 2030, we're still going to be lower and lower and lower on the grad rate. So you, there's always a solution. And you can't look at every penny and dime that, that it's going to cost you to do that. You have to look at the penny and dime you're going to make as a result of doing it. And that's a risk, which is now back to fear. And so technologically, plenty of advancements are going to happen in veterinary medicine. Uh, DNA, which has been out for a while, DNA testing is going to advance. You know, there's going to be significant people that are in the veterinary industry that are making an impact, trend watchers, trend setters. And one thing that you we look at, and I know they've been... Uh, interviewed by you, but I'll kind of explain where I'm at. I've always wanted to leave a mark in this industry. So somehow kind of migrate toward that. And when I look at who's setting the trends, if I look at the CSR market, okay, it's it's a live to live, check to check environment for that CSR. They're not going to get rich. There's no career path, and maybe you'll become a tech. Okay, that's that's just what we accepted. It's not acceptable. If you feel happy about how much it's going to cost you and train and see someone in every nine months new at your front desk, you got to realize that's an inside job. I'm not happy with that. So the trendsetter that I look at are ones that are actually building a career path for CSRs. And the first thing that comes with that is education. And where is that path going to come from? Well, the hospital obviously needs to produce it. They need to be certified. They need to go through a certificate program. And Dr. Clark, which was on your show, do a lot with her and her company. And they have a stellar CSR membership and a veterinary reception certificate of excellence program. And I got to tell you, even being in the industry this long, and I've talked to a practice manager who's got two masters, and he says, this is one of the hardest tests I had to take. And that's that should say something. So the graduates that come through now have a path that they can actually move forward toward. And either whether it's asking more money, whether it's cutting the retention rate, whether it's feeling part of the team, but by doing that, they're now able to communicate with the technician who now can communicate with the doctor and the CSR. And instead of saying, scooting his ass on the rear on a, in the medical record, they can literally write down the correct information about 
potential anal gland problems, scooting, look for parasites, get ready for that. They're all ready for that. They're ready to speak about money. So Jill Clark's a trendsetter. If I look at another one, it's Dr. David Barrett, big trendsetter, someone to keep an eye on in this industry. He was instrumental in working on Anapril, which came out a long time ago, and then ended up uh, working with VCA. He was a medical director at VCA and grew that one, their first hospital, which was owned by Dick Gebhardt. And he he blew that thing up to uh, a block long and, and was knocked it out at knocked it out of the park at 32 million the first year with every specialty you can think of. But now he's he's working for a laboratory and they have an incredible technology they're working on in terms of uh, hemangiosarcoma treatment and certain oncology vaccines and treatments. And so that's a trendsetter. And then the other one, which I speak very highly of, obviously, is Dr. Bob Murtaugh. He's got some initiatives I back. And I t- I'll tell you, going all the way through the hamster wheel, is that I try and work where I can provide a contribution that will change the industry. And our career path for technicians, some states have a ceiling. And some states have no certification whatsoever. So everyone needs to be certified. Everyone needs to be trained. And that technology, just like POC or virtual care, is going to require on the site, uh, at the moment, training. So outside of just like learning about technical responsibilities, duties, animal husbandry, and all the technology that comes along with it to be a good technician, they're going to need to, so for instance, if, if I had a patient that I had to do a DV on a, a Lecronon, right? And I just, oh man, what's the right positioning? I could pull up out of my pocket immediately, just type it in and boom, there's a positioning on all views. I go, okay, that's it. Slip it back in. Well, what's that dosage on Manitol? Boom, there it is. And, and so that's where we're going. It's not always like a, a virtual patient relationship, which is going to expand. Telemedicine will refine itself. And it should. And the third one in that is uh, a middle, mid-level practitioner. Our human counterparts have them for 20 years. Their guidelines and restrictions are very firm. Their CDE is mandatory like ours, but in a different way. And you know, I know for me, my own GP as well as my specialist, when I go back, I see the, I see the nurse practitioner. And I feel confident. Even at the ER when I was took a little visit this year over there, was a nurse practitioner with all the other MDs around. So it, we need to create those paths, which will help A, the shortage, B, a client-patient relationship, and C, a career path. It, it's a win-win. It's an evolution and a paradigm shift. And those are the three areas that I primarily see. So getting back to where I want to leave a mark, I've always done something that was a little bit ahead of the curve. So transportation was ahead of the curve. And as soon as that happened, it's like it's prevalence all over the country. And it should be. Uh, because as Uber and Lyft move forward, uh, there's ones that should be taken care of for the veterinary industry and the pet industry. Uh, that's one. Two, I mentioned about the hyperallergenic, hyperallergenic dog treat. I mean, that's something that was first to market. Incredible research behind it. So, you know, when you go into a door now and you'll see all the packaging with a little gusset at the bottom and a zip up on the top, triangular. So I was the first to bring that to market for the dog treat early on, and it just exploded. Then all the, then all the dog food companies jumped in. So that was neat. So I launched that. And then I worked with uh, Dr. Todd Tams, which was, he was a medical director at before David Barrett at VCA. I worked him when I was at VCA and I worked with Dr. Bill Muir out of Ohio State who focused in on anesthesiology. And what we wanted to do was actually put it down and assemble pain management, canine and feline to start with for elective routine procedures. So here's another thing that I looked at the future. I said, oh my God. Because when I sent animals home and they were just a simple spay. If they thrashed that day, they got a shot of ace, they stayed overnight, there was no swelling, they went home. That doesn't mean they don't experience pain, okay? So, 
so we had all the models and the statistics and data to show that they, they are experiencing pain. And then we went down the list of elective and routine procedures all the way to surgical and trauma. And that's when the fentanyl patch came out. That's when pain management protocols started to adhere. And, and we started within our own network at that time. And it just started to just, boom, explode. Next thing you know, Rimadil's on the market, you know, because now there's a treatment for ONA and, and for canine ONA. And so now you're seeing launches from Zoetis on feline ONA. And so I feel somewhat like I left a mark because it, it kind of changed the industry a little bit. And so I, I look at those and now I get into, uh, there was a couple of, of tests that I launched when I was working at the lab division for Antec and that changed the industry. And so here I am again, my paradigm shift and why I want to leave it is that I look at everything I mentioned prior to like mid-level practitioners to telemedicine to all that. I'm right up the cusp and I'm, I'm on that train and that train is going to happen. All the deniers out there will learn. Change is going to happen and it always happens for the better and it's always painful. You know, I just wrote an article about most of the practitioners that look at change in their hospital. I got to get a consultant. I've got to get an outside consultant to help me. This is just my, I, I need an HR person. I need it. You can keep pointing the fingers everywhere, but at the end of the day, hate that marketing term, but at the end of the day, just point the finger back at you. Because every time you point the finger, there's three pointing back at you. So one, you need to accept that, are you willing to make the real change in yourself to make the change in your team? If you're not prepared and relying on someone else to help you, not gonna work. And I've, I've managed enough hospitals independently to know that that is truth. And, and I think that once you've identified the core issues and you say, oh, you know what? I am the problem. So I can either butt out of the way or help. And you have the experience to help. So go for it. I got a great response from that article. And most of the people I had, I had references in there on, on human medicine and how behavioral culture change occurs within, and, and those dynamics occur within their industry. And it said the same thing, just 99 pages longer and <laughs> a lot more PhDs and MDs behind it. But, it, but really, it, it's an inside job. And if you accept that it's going to happen, there's one component. You got to remain teachable at every level and any age. I mean, for me, I remain teachable. And that means I accept criticism and I learn from criticism. So if there's something I can learn, I'm on it. I'm the first one there because uh, I don't know it all. And if I did, uh, I would be launching all the telemedicine and the imaging and all that. But no, I want to learn it because I know that's where the path is going. And it is changing. Veterinary universities are now beginning to independently on their own assist in the issue of increasing class size, getting started when potential veterinary students are children in elementary school and mm -hmm. putting on educational fairs uh, about animal husbandry. And this is what a veterinarian does. And, and they're not all universities, just a handful, but they're doing the right thing. And they're sending the message out that, hey, this is a great profession. And it is an outstanding profession. And, and I can't think of anything. I straight away once, and I went for a crash course for four weeks, 10-hour days, including Saturdays, for pre-paramedic. And then the next was paramedic. And uh, so I had to work in a hospital, a uh, human hospital environment in the ER for a while, and I rode the ambulances, and we picked up patients and dealt with trauma cases. And you know what? It's not as fulfilling as a human-animal bond. That's why we're here. It didn't last long, but two months. And I was welcomed back with open arms because I was a production factory. Uh, and I knew my craft and because I stayed current. And so now, looking at everything that, that is out there, it's education. I used to believe that there were segmented parts of behavior with inside the veterinary community, just like everybody else. Some are lambs and some are leaders. 
and some are speakers and some are followers. And I like to group them all as leaders and all as followers. And if I group them in that way, then I'll tell them, hey, great course on leadership. Take it to heart. Here's where you go. You can sit in front of your own computer and, and take the course, but learn to be a leader. And we went through that dynamic change when they needed to learn to be a business owner as opposed to just a veterinarian. Whole nother dynamic. And they did well. Took a while. It was painful for many. But now they understand that if you own your own hospital, you're, you need to run your own business. And those, all that accounting and you can get all the CPAs and your lawyers and all that other stuff. But at the end of the day, you need to run and operate and hire. And so when I look at it as a hierarchy, I say, okay, my employees are my number one line item expense. My laboratory is my second line item expense. And I'll go down the line and I'll say, okay, how much is left for education? And it's usually that much. Okay. That much. And I switch that around as, as fast as possible. It's like, well, is this really necessary? Is this really necessary? Or would this be a better growth path with a greater level of education for you and your staff? And it makes sense. Sometimes things are simple. We just don't want to look in the mirror and say, simplicity works. Why am I making it so difficult? I like the fact that veterinarians are really cool. You know, I published a magazine, which got bought out, by the way. It was called Vets, V-E-T-Z, Vets Magazine. And 60% of it was practice management, medical, clinical case studies, and diagnostics. And 40% was lifestyle. Everything you wanted to know about wine, everything you wanted to know about exercise, everything you want to know about vacations and treats and food and cooking and you name it, it was in it. And it just shot off like a rocket. Shot out so good, I changed the way print media at that time. If you remember, all of a sudden, glossier covers, heavier papers came out. That, well, you're welcome. <laughs> and that's because I don't, I, do, I believe the veterinary industry only should have the best, just like any other independent or university or consolidator's mission or vision. The reality is that not every employee, not every dean, and not every independent veterinarian believes in what they put on paper. It's easy to write. It's difficult to, to, to believe and apply. And if you believe and apply, then it will happen. And, and that's, that's, you know, in, in essence, that's where I'm, I come from. So today, whether I'm doing social media or whether I'm doing um, writing or strategies, marketing strategies or communications or business development for usually companies that have brought a product to market, plateaued, rebrand, take it back out to the market. It's all for the better of this sweetheart that's on my lap most Aww. of the day. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's why I do it. That's the reminder. And And, and I know that there is no other profession better than ours. There may be fulfilling for people, but no better than, than the veterinary profession. And that's, that's, how, that's how I work and that's what I believe. And, and I like to be as open and compassionate and contribute as much as I can. And in many times, my contributions don't ask for anything in return because it was passed on to me you know, I went to UCLA at night for school and I worked full time during the day. And when I worked full time during the day in, in that hospital, I had a great mentor. Passed away, unfortunately, in a car accident, but he was unbelievable, Dr. James Craig, a uh, Penwee. And uh, he, he said to me, he said, you know, this is one of the best businesses, if not the best business to be in. And I was like, green. You know, I was young. And I was like, okay, when's my next check coming out? He says, that is your first problem. If you think you're going to get rich, I am rich. He said, if you think you're going to get rich, that's not why you're here. You will get rich as a consequence of being here. You practice good medicine, high quality A medicine, as, a, as opposed to C medicine. And many of us have come from veterinary working environments before we go to vet school. And we've seen the corners cut. 
I went through this whole entire thing about diagnostics and your analysis and why veterinarians are not getting a UA. And it's because it's too hard to catch. The owner doesn't want to drop the animal off for the day. I don't want to do assistocentesis. I, I don't, I don't, I don't. So they just bypass it. Now, if I go back and look at everything I've learned in school, and I go back and look at all the textbooks and in veterinary colleges, is that A, B, or C medicine? Well, it's A, okay? Because sometimes so your analysis, as you know, is sometimes a lot more clinically diagnostic than blood work. It can be. There's something that hasn't changed in veterinary medicine, which is, needs to go through a paradigm shift, is we judge. We judge. We judge what we wear. We judge what you drive. You know, if they come in a jalopy, and I learned my lesson. I went out to, oh, God, uh, it was 1 o'clock. No, it was 11 o'clock at night. I went for a pickup for a female harlequin, spade, dane, unable to get up, was sternal, but unable to get up, hemorrhagic diarrhea. The veterinarian was there doing house calls, gave it doses of dexamethasone three times a week, IV hence the bloat, hence the diarrhea, and dog was able to walk. So I knew because when I walked through the door, the drapes were ripped, the lamps were torn, it was a mess. And I walked in, I said, I'm not getting paid on this one. It didn't matter to me. I just knew, I accepted, I said, I looked at that dog, I said, there's no way I'm leaving. It's just not happening. And if she wants to go to the, the emergency center, she's going. So Back breaking, on comes the brace, out comes the gurney, and I got the dog in the car and went over to the emergency center. And I debriefed the doctor. I gave my notes at the time and the history of the client and the history of the dog. And she, he says, okay, the client's in the exam room, whatever, wherever the reception is, put in the exam room. And uh, it was time for me to process my paperwork. And all I wanted was a signature. Dog was there and fine. Doctor signed off on it. And she said, honey, how much do I owe you? I said, oh, no problem. I didn't even say anything. I said, no problem. And, and it, I didn't say it's on me. I just, just, just need your signature. You know, she put her hand on my forearm, looked me deadpan in the face. And she says, I got to tell you, never judge people. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, when you get really scared, and you just feel your bladder kind of. And that's exactly <laughs> what it was. I was like, I, I was like, oh, my God. And she said she opened her purse. I'm not kidding. She had rolls of 10 grand, six of them, with a 38 caliber in her purse. And she says, don't judge because the way my house looks. Don't judge because the way I live. How much do I owe you? I said, it's $450. So she gave me $550, $100 tip. And she says, I'll see you when my dog comes home. And I'm like, this dog's not coming home. It's unable to use its legs. Rear deficits were gone. And sure enough, six weeks later, she calls. She says, my dog's coming home. I said, that's fantastic. And I said, great. Met her at the hospital. Dog walked out. She says, oh, I was here every day massaging while they gave treatment, had daily diagnostics, daily treatment, and $6,000 bill in 1992. It was a lot of money back then. And she gladly paid it. So I brought the animal home and <laughs> with confidence and courage. I said, it's $150. She goes, no problem. Here you go. Give me another tip. She says, I said, I wish you the best. I hope I don't see you under those circumstances again. And thank you for the lesson. So you have to remain teachable in this world. You know, we're the first to say every veterinarian and every technician, the worst they want to hear is the word no. They can't stand it. It's like, it's okay. Just get through it. Why is there a no? If this is the best for your pet, why is there a no? Is it money? Is it something else? Is it, what is it? And then we can work it out. And, and just because remember at the end of the day, again, there's a patient there. That's why you're there. Please, I've done many calls that were gratis and it comes back tenfold. And I'm not saying for you to go out there and give your services away. I'm just saying that's the way I ran my business. And that's the way I run my business today because the more I give, the more I get. And the more I charge, the more I get. So it's good. It was a nice life lesson learned in a very hard way. And when I did the speaker um, circuit, 
all in between CBMA, AVMA, Tel Aviv, Cyprus, and Chiang Mai, Thailand. And there was two topics talked about. Social media was one of them and judgment was the other. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, these were business people outside of the veterinary industry. They just ate it up because they understood. That's like, wow, that's my barrier to success. It's, it's, It's me. And as long as they realize it, you can continue to do it. But at some point, you're going to get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you will change. You will change or implode. And there's no reason to implode. It's too great of an industry to implode. So, you know, that's, uh, that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> I'm definitely taking away a lot of stay curious and be a learner. If mm-hmm. we have to put anything to our identity, I frequently talk about that, you know, a job description should not be your identity, staying a learner, make that your identity. And you approach thing as, oh, I'm going to learn this. And so change just becomes a learning activity, not necessarily this terrible thing that is is happening to you. And I think that's how we're going to move things forward. Now, I can't help, but as I'm listening to you, now, I'm sure not everybody is feeling this way, but for me, I, I just wanted to say, you know, I want to be another trendsetter. I want to be another one of those who embraces these opportunities to leave an impact by making this wonderful profession, you know, better for everyone who is blessed to be a part of it, which I love them all. Yeah. Um, so you are one of these people, you work with a lot of trendsetters and people who they see a problem. And, you know, I was talking to Dr. Yu last night and the way he said it, I thought was so wonderful is he looks at things, something that could be better. The way he approaches things is if I don't, then very likely no one else will. So it's a very unique perspective. And I I was like, Mm -hmm. ah, I bet that is a trend in people who are these that are making big impacts and making a difference. But in your words, what are some of these characteristics that you see in people who are making a a difference in our profession? There is a collective characteristic I see of all the people I listed and, and many more that are making a difference in this industry. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of parts to that, or I should say ingredients to that, but the desire to find a cause, well, I have found a cause, you have found a cause, and what are you going to do to bring that cause to fruition? And that's if you don't do it, Henry's right, Dr. Yu's right, if you don't do it, no one will do it. If you don't do it, somebody else will do it. And if you don't do it, you won't satisfy that urge that you have. And I always wanted to look at it, the characteristics. And, and this is where I go back. Everyone I mentioned all looked toward the inside first. What are my pros, my cons, my highs, my lows? What can I contribute that would make a difference to one individual? And if I make a difference to one individual, I can make a difference to a group of individuals. Hence, it goes on and on and on. It's like that hairdo commercial. And they tell two friends and they tell two. So uh, the characteristic that I look for is that I know the difference between self-esteem and ego. Okay? Big difference. A lot of people get caught up in ego. All the ones that I've mentioned, including uh, Dr. Yu, it's not ego. He's not flying to to South Korea to break his back at his age for ego. Okay, he's going because there's purpose, and so they find their cause. I find their cause, and the second is really to identify. And I mentioned it. What is your individual purpose? And if you look at it like a growth tree, start at the top of the tree instead of at the bottom. Start at the top of the tree and say, okay, here's my purpose. Here's my goals. And then you can look at the branches. Say, what's gonna, what branches do I need to fill this tree? I'm at the top because I've already made the decision. So now what do I need to do? Is it this initiative? Is it this project? Is it this trend setting? I, I look at 
what you are doing as beyond trendsetting. Because I listen to everyone's podcast. And what brings a level of difference between you and others is that you look at the core of why we're in the industry. You look at the core of what keeps us in the industry. I mean, you're constantly searching for that answer. That's a great question and an outstanding answer because everyone's got a different story. So you can only learn from their stories. You know, at dinner time, and I put on Nancy Grace as a podcast because I like to upset myself. And and but what's interesting is she's always trying to find the reason why. And you're you're focusing in on that. And and I think you're at the pinnacle. You're on the top. Now it just needs to penetrate. There are so many social media sites where veterinarians belong to outside of our market. And, and I watch, uh, you know, they're either a, a skier, a tennis player, chef. I mean, you go down the entire list and you're like, wow, that's got to be some story. And, you know, some are travelers that have gone to 63, 65 countries in the world. I know one veterinarian, very successful specialty in animal emergency facility, built that thing up. He was out of room in 18 months on a 10,000 square foot building, literally. Every year, he would do something different. So I produced a film with him, and it was Shakespearean film in modern day time. So we had John Carradine and Danny Trejo, and it was a whole list of cast because they always wanted to do Shakespeare and no one ever gave him the chance. So it's like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so, you know, we developed, we made a movie and it did okay. He's uh, decided to fix a 1924 Ford and drive ac- across the Mongolian desert in a race. And he did it. Okay. And so if you look at what pushes those people, So I looked at Scott. I said, Scott, what pushes you? Because he's triple boarded on top of his master's, on top of his DVM degree. He's triple boarded. I mean, he's never stops learning. And I'll give you a good example. In the Shakespearean movie, there's a fight scene. So sure enough, he gets someone who is probably the best on the West Coast in terms of knife fighting and technique. And he takes lessons for eight weeks because he wants to know that he's doing it right. And he learned and learned. And the same, you know, the acting coaches and the actors came over and they helped him and they talked. And I mean, he's constantly learning. And his whole family has that mental attitude. And if you keep that characteristic at the top of your game, you you can't fall. You may have, you may slip a little bit here and there. You know, (laughs) that's called life. And life is fun. You know, one thing I've learned at my age is that I have really accepted things a lot easier than I used to. I used to really be rebellious and angry. And, you know, I feel like this is not fair. And why is this happening to me? And it always happens to me. And woe is me. And blah, blah, blah. But the characteristic of being accepting situations for what they are, you will always come on the outside with a solution. And so... All the people I mentioned, and to answer your question, you know, you you look at your core purpose, what you really feel you contribute, and why. And when you solve those, you're on your way. Every day is a different experience. And I used to dread getting up in the morning. Now I'm up at three thirty four in the morning. I can't wait to get hit hit the computer and start working on on projects. And the phones start ringing from the East Coast, and I'm, you know, then nine o'clock or eight o'clock hits, it starts ringing from the from the West Coast, and I'm like, and I'm just plugging away. Next thing you know, I'm looking at the time; it's like six o'clock, and it's not that I want to do that. I would be bored if I retired, to be honest with you. <laughs> but and this profession has so much to gain, and I have so much to learn, and I want to do both. So. Those are really the key characteristics that I'm looking at for success. You can you can read a 150 million different Harvard articles on eight steps to success, five steps to leadership. You know, in the end of the day, it's print and paper. You may pick up one or good two ideas. Here's the question: You plan on applying them? Mm. 
I planned when I read it, but the news is on at 11, you know, and the kids go to sleep and I got to pay tuition and one's going to university. And, uh, you know, it's like applying is a whole nother ball game. And, and so uh, for any, anyone, uh, including you, when you, when you look at podcasting, it's, what you have is a very unique audience, a very unique reach. And I think you've interviewed enough people to understand the commonalities that they all have. And those are learning experiences for yourself and for me when I watch them, when I watch the interviews. It's a learning experience. It's what's going to take me personally inside my soul to the next level. Okay. And so, I take that to heart and I look at maybe someone beat me to the punch on initiative. Well, I'm going to get behind them and push them with their initiative straight through because I know I have something to contribute. That's all part of remaining teachable, learning constantly, never ends. You know, the, the old, that old saying about you can sleep when you're dead, so true. Uh, it's not that we don't need our breaks. It's not that it's very important that we get our eight hours or 7.5 hours. Uh, and and yeah, I go to bed at 7.30 and 8. Okay, uh, that's my choice. You're looking at a decade that stayed up till two in the morning and went to work at six. Okay, so I did my share <laughs> <laughs> of fun. And it's just not where my head's at today. And where my head's at today is I have 68 tabs open at all times. And I, I read all the news that comes through. I post all the news that needs to get, to, to get posted. I, I don't edit much. I write articles, and then I work on clients' um, initiatives and, and their stuff. And, and then I have, like, epiphanies. It's like, wow, why hasn't anyone ever done this before? Or this is really cool. I got I to gotta reach out. I believe in what this particular person or this initiative or this university is doing. I want part of it. And that's how it works. That's how it works. I will jump to the final question of the okay. final four that I, I ask, because I think at the end of the day, this is one of the, sorry, I use the, I use the phrase. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, use my, I hate it too. <laughs> this is, you know, one of the mo most important questions we can ask ourselves and, and what is something that you are most grateful for? One thing I am most grateful for is that I have the understanding today, not that it works 100%, but to live in the moment. Most people live in the future, and a lot of people live in the past. If I learn to live in the moment, I only have bad moments in a day. I don't have a bad day. And that's how I get by. And so I can have five, six great moments in one shot, or I can have six horrible moments. But I also get to enjoy my dog on my lap. I have a daughter that's actually going on tour uh, in a band, which is like huge excitement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I, there's just so much for life. Uh, I wake up, it's fresh air, there's snow on the mountains, and it's 90 degrees with palm trees. I mean, I have nothing to complain about. The only thing I have to complain about is me complaining. <laughs> and, and so uh, to answer your question, I live in the moment. And when this moment ends, I'll feel really good inside my soul, not my heart, not my mind, not my ego, not my self-esteem. I'll feel good. And that's what it's all about. And I know I had a success today. So. That you did. This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, Vet Lifers. <laughs>